I'd now like to draw the house to the motion that stands before it, which is this house believes democracy is for sale. And I now look to Lord Paul Tyler, Exeter College, to open the case for the proposition. Thank you. One of my first visits to the Union as a, a newly arrived undergraduate was to hear Dennis Norton, the great scriptwriter, begin his speech as follows. I've just returned from six months on Capri. I was finishing a novel. I'm a slow reader. <laughs> he, of course, knows how to treat the audience at the Oxford Union. I'm a bit out of date. But what I have to say to you this evening is really serious. And it also relates to a debate I, in which I also took part in those days, which was all about the black arts of advertisers, that they were getting more sophisticated, but we could still choose not to be persuaded. Now, both of those lost experiences, long lost experiences, are relevant to tonight's debate. But before I come to that, I want to mention something about the team opposite. I've had some difficulty in identifying something sufficiently ridicule for uh, James Lamming. Um, <laughs> I was promised by no less than the President that he would give me all the dirt. I worked very hard, I looked everywhere. It would appear that he is an extremely rich man because he has succeeded in taking out every single reference to himself in Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> However, our two other guests, from the other side of the Atlantic have no such problem. Um, some would say they're famous, some would say they're infamous. Uh, not me, of course. Uh, James Bopp Jr. is described as a conservative lawyer. Now, in American parlance, that means something a good deal further to the right than anything we have in this country. For example, he's spent more than 30 years fighting limits on campaign spending and has campaigned vigorously in the Republican Party against any recognition of LGBT rights. In this, the great bastion of free speech at the Oxford Union, I'm sure we will all listen with interest to his views. Floyd Abrams seems more complicated to me. My research has revealed an unsurpassed expertise in all aspects of the First Amendment, and this appears to have taken him in a variety of directions when pursuing the libel laws of the USA. For example, you can't be all bad if you take on the Daily Mail. <laughs> I assume, incidentally, that that's the UK version. But did he win? I think we should be told. I confess that having read about his successes, I was really disappointed and indeed somewhat surprised that Mr. Abrams was not on our side of the argument. So, whatever the rest of us lack in legalese, these two giants will undoubtedly make up for that with mind-boggling complexity. By contrast, my case is startlingly simple. Our democratic processes are now more than ever influenced by the investment of a very small number of multimillionaires rather than by small contributions from millions of ordinary citizens. Some of you will know that an analysis of the private funding, the private individual funding of the EU referendum campaign on both sides a year ago shows that the vast majority came from less than a dozen Men. Interesting. Women don't seem to waste their money on politics in quite the same way. And of course, that didn't take into account the hidden contributions which are now under investigation by the Electoral Commission. The Commission is examining, and I quote, whether one or more donations, including services, accepted by Leave EU, was impermissible. And this focuses on the contribution of a company owned by the US billionaire Robert Mercer 
a friend of Aaron Banks, Nigel Farage, and various key allies of Donald Trump. Undisclosed donations of free services are, of course, illegal under our laws in this country. The tangled web of services provided by so -called, for so-called psychometric profiles to target swing voters played a big part in the referendum campaign, and indeed Aaron Banks claimed it won it for leave. Some of you, I hope, have had the opportunity of reading the detailed exposure by Carol Cadwallader in The Observer. And it's all on the record, so I don't need to refer to it. But in any case, Mr. Bopp can probably explain why such a shadowy figure as US billionaire Robert Mercer, having previously concentrated on attacking pro-choice groups and helping the Trump campaign, should have suddenly taken such an expensive interest in the Brexit campaign here, because he has been hired by Mr. Mercer in the past. And another American, who claims to have been the author of the notorious Take Back Control slogan, is Jerry Gunster. His Washington PR firm boasts that they directed the Leave campaign to run a campaign free of facts, but playing on voters' emotions, such as fear of immigrants. And again, their very expensive assistance was bank bankrolled by Aaron Banks. By now, you may be wondering just why there were those vicious attacks on foreigners, particularly, of course, President Obama, who gave us some simple advice from his point of view on the choice in our referendum. Foreigners do play a big part in some of the campaigns this side of the water. So that brings me to the 2015 general election, and indeed right up to date with the current campaign. Two years ago, the Conservatives raised and spent more than all the other parties put together. Despite the fondness of Len McCluskey for Jeremy Corbyn to the tune of several million pounds, Theresa May will almost certainly do this again this year, and she's already benefited from thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds, from oil company bosses. However, the worst scandal has been the way in which this money has been spent. The secrecy surrounding donations has been overtaken by clandestine election expenditure. Since 1883, not 1983, 1883, the amount of money that can be spent in one constituency, pouring unlimited amount of cash into a constituency campaign, has been rightly seen as rich men buying seats, buying MPs. At every one of the contests that I myself fought, I was warned by my agent that if we overspent by a pound, we could end up in an election court. All parties in recent general elections have tried to find ways round these stringent limits by use of the relatively much more relaxed restrictions on the national expenditure campaign. In 2015, both the Conservative and Labour parties targeted swing voters in less than 100 marginal seats with unsolicited material of all sorts, using mail shots, social media, call centres, local party advertising. While all the parties were careful to avoid mentioning the local candidates' names, this was within the letter, if not the spirit of the law. However, the Conservatives overstepped that red line with their deployment of staff and activists to some of these seats, explicitly campaigning to secure the election of specific, specified, named candidates. Now, those candidates, justifiably, were able to claim that the National Party had reassured them that they were not liable for the cost or its reporting to the Electoral Commission. So they escaped prosecution. But the Conservative Party as a whole was fined the heaviest allowable amount for failing to declare £275,000 of relevant expenditure. Both the Commission, subsequently the Crown Prosecution Service, after the police investigations concluded, and I quote, 
the Conservative Party's spending return was incomplete and inaccurate. They reported this, this spending should have been recorded as relating to the local constituency campaign. <coughs> Significantly, Theresa May's presidential campaign is once again in the hands of Linton Crosby from Australia, Jim Messina from the USA, and once again antipathy to the interference of foreigners. Previously, of course, it was somebody from Brussels or somebody from uh, the Oval Office who was thought to be uh, intervening in our politics. But now that antipathy seems to be very selective. Indeed, it was Mr Messina who claimed that the Tories spent £30 million pounds in the 2015 campaign when the national permitted limit was under £20 million. Pounds. So, once more, I submit to you, our democracy is being bought in a semi-secret <coughs> auction. Since that previous debate in this hall many years ago, to which I referred earlier, the hidden persuaders have become ever more elusive and yet even more persuasive. And this is the dire threat to our democracy that my private member's bill, which got a second reading in the House of Lords on the 10th of March, seeks to address. And I will hope to reintroduce it in the new Parliament. Mr President, your prescience in selecting this topic for this debate on this date suggests that you alone knew that the Prime Minister was about to announce a snap election, despite everything she'd said about not having one, despite all her promises not to exploit labour divisions. You knew. I'm very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on both sides of the Atlantic, freedom of speech is anything but free. It is becoming very, very, very expensive. I urge you to support the motion.